Hey guys, my name's Thomas Busby, and welcome to part five, the conclusion of my series of Fujifilm's greatest lens for wildlife photography. Now, if you haven't already watched the previous episodes to this, I'll leave a link for them down in the description below where I go into a little more detail, a lot more detail, about the zoom, the sharpness, the autofocus speed, and the tally converters. But if you're relatively new to wildlife photography and you just wanna know what is the best lens to get, in this episode, this final conclusion, we're gonna answer that question. the word the best in a video I think is actually pretty pretty lofty you got to, you got to set pretty high expectations when you want to state something is the best and what is the best as always can only truly be answered by you depending on what you want to shoot and what you are going to end up shooting but before we dive into the whole lot I want to give you a big list of everything you really should consider when buying a lens for wildlife photography so first up, and maybe the most obvious, is the amount of zoom. This is always measured in millimeters. 200's okay, 400 would be great, 600's probably fantastic, but as a general guide, the more, the better. See, the reason zoom's so important is most animals don't like humans getting too close to them. It disturbs them, so the further away you can be, the less likely you are to disturb an animal, the more likely you are to get the shot. Next up is aperture. Aperture has a few major effects. Number one is how blurry your background will be, though zoom definitely has a bigger impact on this. Two is the brighter you can have your aperture, the higher you can have your shutter speed, improving your chances of freezing motion of a fast moving subject. And or number three is the brighter you can have your aperture, the better quality you can have out of your ISO performance, resulting in a higher quality and more croppability out of your shots. Next up is price. This is very, very subjective for each individual person. And some of you will have no issues about putting thousands of dollars into a lens, and some of you really are just on a tighter budget. It is subjective, but it's worthwhile considering. And the weight, just like price, can be very subjective. See, if the sun's out, maybe your guns are out, and you have no issues carrying a heavier lens around. Or maybe you're hiking a long distance, and that extra weight might be a bit of a burden for you. Especially if trying to shoot fast moving, sporadic moving subject, weight can definitely slow you down. However, maybe you are more of a stationary photographer. Maybe you spend most of your wildlife time sitting in a hide waiting for an animal to come into your shot. In this case, weight might not have such an issue, but still subjective but worth considering. Next up is image stabilizer. Now all of the lenses we're looking at have different degrees of image stabilizer out of them. An image stabilizer will have different effects. See, if you're shooting very fast moving subjects, then quite often your shutter speed is so high that you're not gonna get camera shake, image shake anyway. You need that higher shutter speed just to freeze the motion of your subject. But if you're say doing more portraits, more slower moving animals, then you can definitely drop that shutter speed a bit and that image stabilizer can compensate for that and help reduce that camera shake, allowing you to have better quality out of your ISO performance, maybe a more optimal aperture, and you can really push the boundaries of things a little bit if your subject isn't moving too fast. That's where image stabilizer can have a huge effect. Now I've talked about weather sealing a lot before in different series and I absolutely love it. See, I love atmosphere in my shots. I love rain, I love sand, I love that dust, I love that, that fog. All of those things though, sand, moisture, dust landing on there and then you close that up, it will suck all that grime into your lens and slowly or in some cases very quickly kill your lens. Weather sealing will very, very much help protect against that, especially with anything that is a tube design like this, that weather sealing is a huge bonus. And I think it's pretty critical for the kind of work I like to do. It might not affect some of you. I know plenty of people have had good results from non-weather sealed lenses, but I think in wildlife, that rain, that dust, that atmosphere is very important and weather sealing can really help prolong the life of your gear. And finally, I considered autofocus speed, sharpness, and the tally converters. Now, if you haven't already seen these three previous episodes, I go into far more in-depth detail about each of these three facts, and if you'd like to watch them, I'll leave links for them down in the description below. Now, I'm about to show you a bunch of lists ranking all the lenses and tele converters using an algorithm I made up. Each list is a little different depending on which one suits you the best, but also don't put too much weight behind, say, the rank that each lens or tally converter is in, but more about the score differences between each of the, the results. It is far more important to get the one which, say, best suits you, for whatever list best suits you, and those score differences, in some cases, can be very, very minimal. So don't put too much weight behind the rank. 
So to start things off, let's remove the most subjective factor, which is ignoring price. Now this isn't going to surprise any of you, with the 200mm gaining the top spot, and the 100-400 taking out third place. But I'd also like to draw your attention to the bottom of this list, where the 100-400 and the 70-300, once you add the two times tally converters, just get too dark, too slow and soft to really be effective lens for most forms of wildlife photography. And just to be on top of that, if we also remove weight as an equation from that factor, things stack up pretty similar. With the 200mm including any of the teleconverter options really smashing things out of the park again, and this list here is really showing the very best options if you want to get the very best possible results. Factoring autofocus speed, weather sealing, image quality, just not price and weight. But one thing that might be upsetting a few of you is the cheap little XC 50-230 Mark II's position on these lists. See, not all forms of wildlife photography require you to have the very best of the best. Or maybe while you're out shooting you like to do a little bit of landscape photography while you're doing this. And so I think a really nice metric to look at is the amount of zoom you get for the quality of your shot. With the 100-400 and the 200mm taking out the top spots, I want to bring special focus to how high the XC 50-230 Mark II is on this list, and how little difference there is between it and the 200mm f2. And while I'm not saying these two lenses should be compared for wildlife photography, I am stating that the image quality out of Fujifilm's cheapest telephoto lens compared to their premium beast monster of a lens is very, very similar. Also do note that's the 50-230 Mark II, not the Mark I. But for many of us, things like price and weight aren't just factors that can be easily ignored. So if we put those factors back into the algorithm, I think it gives us truly what is the best lens to get for wildlife photography if you're starting out. With the overall winning spot going to the new 70-300, which while not the greatest lens of the bunch as far as image quality goes, it really is a fantastic option considering all other factors. But please note that the 100-400 is nipping right at its heels, and even though it gets very little range, the 50-140 to really is fast, bright, and a sharp lens that will get you stunning results, if you can get close enough. But as I always love to state, Fujifilm's best lens for wildlife photography really does depend on so many factors, subject, distance, light, and ignoring your skill with a camera. But hopefully this video and this series has given you the information you need to answer that question for you. If you found this video helpful, then please consider checking out the other few videos in this series as I go into far more in-depth detail about things like autofocus speed, sharpness, and those tally converters, and how they affect the lenses you might already have. Or if you've been following along with this video for the whole time, please consider heading over to my website and maybe buying a print. Or if buying a print isn't something you can afford at the moment, just hit that subscribe button, and share this video with your friends, it would mean the world to me guys. But otherwise, until next time, I'll catch you next time.